Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We find ourselves in Luke chapter 11 and um, once again we're, we're, we're interacting with the teachings and actions of Jesus uh, as he goes uh, throughout Judea, Galilee, and throughout all, all of Israel. Um, we begin with the issue of prayer. Um, you may recall that whenever we, we, we looked at the uh, Gospel of Matthew, we talked about it then, I think we've, we've brought it up since, that Matthew's Gospel uh, he likes to lump large teachings of Jesus together. So in Matthew 13, for example, we have the kingdom parables. And in Matthew's account, they're one right after the other. The kingdom of God is like a man who went out to sow seed. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a fish full, or a, a net full of fish, right? And, and, and you just, just keep going uh, one after another. Luke breaks them up, right? He's, his, his organization is likely more chronological, though not strictly chronological, than, than Matthew's is, where, where it's more thematic. Um, and so what we have then in Luke's account is portions of the Sermon on the Mount that Matthew has as one large chunk uh, spread throughout the, the Gospel of Luke. We actually, a few days ago, looked at uh, parts of the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Luke, but it wasn't the, the entire thing. So we're actually returning to um, one of the themes and, and teachings in the Sermon on the Mount here in Luke chapter 11, but as you'll see, uh, the chapter isn't dominated by such teachings. And so Luke likes to mix teaching with, with action, whereas Matthew uh, you know, will have a large teaching section with several chapters of, of ministry and then another teaching section and whatnot. Just a difference of preference and, and, and a difference of, of emphasis. So the question the disciples have there at the end of verse 1 is simply, Lord teaches how to pray. So, so what follows is what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, now, now, as we look at the Lord's Prayer, we won't spend a lot of time on it because of the length of this chapter. Um, but but what, what's important about the Lord's Prayer is that it is a model prayer uh, more than it is the Lord's Prayer. Um, the Lord's Prayer implies that this is the prayer that Jesus said over and over again. It's really a model prayer. Uh, you, you see uh, what Jesus does here, and you take themes out of that, uh, and, and you apply it to your own prayer life. Um, so, so Jesus is given an example of a prayer, short prayer, uh, that, that we, we can follow. Uh, so that means that when we approach the Lord's Prayer as if it is some sort of magical formula, that if you say it um, you know, before dinner, the calories you consume won't count toward your weight loss program, right? I mean, it's, 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 we, we approach the Lord's Prayer. Many people, this is the only passage of the Bible they may know because they've said it over and over again in various settings, and they think that, that by s simply reciting it, we, we are actually praying. Now, I, I do think there is some room for recite the Lord's Prayer as an act of worship, as an act of prayer, or whatnot. But if, if that is the, the makeup of our prayer life, then, then, then we're completely missing the point of this model prayer. So we need to take some principles out of it. So he starts there in uh, verse uh, 2, uh, there at the end, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. If that sounds weird, it's because we always quote Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. Luke's is a little shorter, and it's just a model. Right? Um, and so you see uh, uh, worship there, um, Father, hallowed be your name, uh, your kingdom come, so it's a kingdom-centric uh, prayer. Uh, you, you see... Uh, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, so, so, so you see worship, you, you see request, give us this day our daily bread. Remember that bread is what you ate every day of the week. Um, and so uh, to request, give us this day our daily bread. He's not asking for great riches. Um, and hopefully the uh, prosperity heretics will hear me on that. But rather just this daily sustenance. And what you're doing there is, is as you worship your father, you are at the same time trusting him, right? In fact, he'll use the example in, in the paragraph that follows is what father, would his son ask for bread, will give him a snake, right? Well, well no father worth his, uh, worth his salt will, will do that. Um, and that is the idea here. So, so, so uh, because we recognize in prayer of our need for God, uh, our prayer should, should, should reflect that. So God is sovereign, worthy of worship, 
and we rely him for our daily needs not our bank account not our investments but 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 solely in the sovereign god surely the pandemic has demonstrated that god is the one who provides not the stock market how many people uh, their their retirement account really just collapsed as as a result of of, of the pandemic and and maybe you, you have gotten some of that back I, I, I don't know but um, our um, uh, provision isn't smart planning though I think that is important it's ultimately a result of leaning on the sovereign care of God and then then, then we have the gospel part of, of a prayer forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us and so so we understand that the gospel is both justification and sanctification uh, they're separate yes but they are also inseparable so so forgive us right that's a plea for salvation so as a it's a reminder that we should regularly plea for grace uh, not that because we need to be saved again but because the art of sanctification is a return to the gospel right so 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 as i i plea for forgiveness for you uh i i help me in my forgiving of others right i mean if we pray that and practice it what a difference this world would be and lead us not into temptation so, so this is a, another request that that as you provide for us physically, you will provide for us spiritually, and and, and out of that, uh, in, in Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer, um, he's going to emphasize the issue of persistence. Uh, in Matthew's account, he's going to emphasize forgiveness, but in Luke's, he's going to emphasize persistence. Um, and so he tells the story of uh, a friend. So you go up to it's a, another parable. So so you you go to a friend's house. And you're knocking on the door. He said, "You know, lend me three loaves of bread, right?" And and you've been on this long journey. You're starving, all that sort of stuff. And and your friend comes out and says, "No, I don't have the time. Uh, you know, the wife and kids are in bed. Um, you're a nuisance. Get out of my house, right?" Uh, but but then it, it, but then eventually we read that um, verse eight. Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his um, uh, impudence. So that is because of his persistence. Um, he will rise and give him whatever he needs, right? So this is a theme actually in, in Luke's gospel as regards to prayer, and that is persistence in prayer. So when we pray, first of all, a, a ritualistic prayer like the Lord's Prayer, just because we're supposed to, it's, it's, it's empty words babbling. That's an emphasis on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's account. Um, or we just pray once, and then we throw up our hands and say, well, I don't, I don't, I, God's not doing what I want him to do, which is arrogant, frankly. But we do this all the time. Is, is we'll, we'll pray once or, or we'll, we'll pray simply and thinking that is sufficient. But what we get in the Bible is persistence in prayer, never giving up in prayer, making prayer a regular habit and to plead and, and, and to desire the goodness of God in our lives. Too often our prayers, we don't plead enough. Right? So, so here... In that story, in that parable, Jesus then says, I tell you, ask. That is, keep asking like the persistent man. It will be given to you. Seek. That is, keep seeking like the persistent man, and you will find. Knock. That is, keep knocking, and the door will be opened to you. So the issue is persistence. So it would be better if, if, we, if we use the Lord's Prayer as a model of of, of worship, of request, of, of grace, all of that, and, and, and thanksgiving, allow that to be a model, but then persist in our prayers. I believe it was Luther who, uh, this may be in his, uh, my favorite book on prayer is Luther's skinny little book. I think it's called A Simple Way to Pray or something like that. It was written to his barber who wanted to know a simple way to pray. He used the illustration of, of his dog at dinner. You know, he's got a dog inside. Um, and uh, uh while they're eating, the dog just sits there and looks longing at his master, right? We, we, we've all seen this. Um, and, and Luther makes the comment, this may be in his uh, table talks, um, oh, that I may pray the way this dog, uh, you know, begs for food, right? To, to be persistent and to long even for the crumbs from, from, the, from the table of his master. Right? I think there's something to that. So, so may, may, may today we, we, we improve our prayer life because Lord knows we need it. Uh, a, a better prayer life now more than ever. Well, what's interesting is is we go from prayer to to demons. One of the things I've noticed in our uh, exploration of Luke's gospel 
is the persistence of the demonic in this gospel. Um, and, and often it is to, for, for theological reasons, um, in the sense that it shows us who Jesus is. We're going to see that here. But also for thematic reasons that we see um, that, that Luke um, correlates the demonic with the religious elites and with those who reject Jesus. We, we get hints of that e even in, in this chapter. So verse 14, Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. But you'll notice here, it's, it's just a simple story. We, we don't get any details. We know he was mute. Now he's not mute. Praise be the Lord. But then, I just find this fascinating. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, and, and I, I can be guilty of that at, at times. Verse 15, but some of them said. So, so, so you have um, a contrast between a man who's demonized and couldn't speak, but when he speaks, it is in the context of marveling the works of God. Then you have those who can speak, and what is it that they do? They don't marvel at the grace of God. They criticize the work of God. And they attribute to Jesus um, not the works of God, but the works of Satan. And so, so I do think there's a contrast there. The one who is mute is saying more. <laughs> uh, or we could say the one who is mute uh, was just as demonized as, as these over here who can speak because they seem to be working for the same master. Jesus cleanses one, and he, he calls on the other to repent for their own cleansing, but but they refuse. Nevertheless, notice, he says, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, uh, the prince of demons. Beelzebul is, is Satan, uh, the Satan. So just for sake of um, simplicity, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just go with that. So so the prince of, of demons. By the way, it's Beelzebul that, uh, where the Lord of the Flies title comes from, because uh, it's basically what it, what it means, comes from the Old Testament. But anyways, um, so, so we see that they, they use their words not to marvel Christ, but, but to, to, to disparage him. Um, and that phrase, he cast out demons by, by Satan um, in, in the other Gospels, I think Luke will get around to this. I could be wrong. Uh, is in that context where we get the unpardonable sin. But that's not where Luke goes with it. Verse 18, Jesus, uh, or verse 17, Jesus responds, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. That is the passage that Lincoln quotes in, uh, is that the Gettysburg Address? Or is it the, the inaugural address? Uh, a divided house will fall. I hate America. We kind of need to realize this now. Uh, verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? So two things Jesus says there. One, this is asinine nonsense you're saying. Why would Satan cast out Satan? Right? It's just ridiculous. The other is is a is, is a shot. It's a mic drop. It's a uh, what's the glasses that says thug life, something like that. It's what Jesus d does here. He says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do you cast them out by? So we see here that Jesus accused them of being demonized. Wow, what, what an incredible statement that is. Again, Jesus is not meek and mild. He is often mean and wild. Um, Verse 20, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's really the whole point of, of this, this narrative. The kingdom of God has, has come upon you. Well, I want to skip down just for the sake of time. We've probably gone too long now as it is. And I want to look at one passage, and we'll call it a day. Uh, and that is verse 29 to 32. Here Jesus uh, really gives us a helpful way of reading uh, the Bible as a whole, but particularly the Old Testament. Notice what he does. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So, so when people come and say, Give us a sign and we will believe in you, what they're talking about is cosmic signs, more likely. So yes, Jesus is uh, cleansing excuse me, the, the demon eyes. He's healing the blind and the mute and the deaf and the dead and all that. But what they want uh, because of the Old Testament prophecies are cosmic signs, the stars falling, the, the sun going dark, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but Jesus says, you know, that I'm, I'm here to bring the kingdom, not, not to do a light show. Uh, and so Jesus says, here's a sign for you, the sign of Noah. Now, what is the sign of Noah? The sign of Noah is, as, as he says it here, um, he was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish sea monster. So too the Son of Man for three days, three nights 
um, will be the heart of the earth. That's the sign of Noah. And he'll say at the end here that someone greater than Noah is here. And then he goes and he says, um, the queen of the south, remember Queen Sheba, rises up, comes to Jerusalem, and meets Solomon. And, and uh, she, she recognizes uh, the, the, and, uh, the wisdom of Solomon. Then he adds, someone greater than Solomon is here. So what it is we have in the Old Testament is the Old Testament, uh, in its narrative and, and in its, its law and, and, and its literature, is all pointing us to Jesus. So what we see in Jesus is that he is a true and better Jonah. Jonah was in the heart of earth for three days and three nights to save, to save a city. Jesus is in the heart of earth for three days and three nights to save a people. Uh, Solomon uh, may have been wise, but, but the true and greater Solomon is here. Solomon, uh, though wise, was also a great fool. Jesus is true wisdom, a true fulfillment of, of the Garden of Eden. Uh, if, if we had time, we could explore that. So Jesus is a true and better Adam. He's a true and better uh, uh, Abel. He's a true and better Seth. He's a true and better Noah. Uh, he's a true and better uh, Abraham, true and better Isaac and Jacob and, and Joseph and Judah. True and better Moses and Joshua and Miriam and Aaron. He's a true and better Samuel and David and Solomon. He's a true and better Elijah. True, true and better than, than, than all of them. True and better Esther. True and better than Boaz and Ruth and Naomi. True and better than all of them. Um, because the Bible anticipates Jesus. He is the center of Scripture. This, he is the center of history. Therefore, he should be the center of our lives. This is a Christocentric way of reading scripture. And, and, and Luke uh, at times shows us this pattern. Uh, another example of this would be in Luke 23, or actually Luke 24, uh, with the uh, walk to Emmaus, where he, he takes him through the Old Testament and shows how every passage, every verse, every line is about Jesus, which means the Bible is not about you. It is ultimately about Jesus and encountering him. Hopefully we've done that in our study and in our daily devotions. And Lord willing, we'll continue to do that moving forward, starting, Lord willing, tomorrow when we're in Luke chapter 12. See you then.